my name is Yuri Olsha. I work uh, for Isovalent, uh, which is part of Cisco now. Uh, I work as a Linux kernel engineer, and I also work on Tetragon, which is the topic of my presentation. The plan basically uh, is to introduce the Tetragon, like I will try to give some high-level overview, uh, what it's doing and what's like the ecosystem around it, and hopefully the most of the talk, I will try to uh, run the examples and show you uh, how easy it is actually to, uh, to do some monitoring. So, first of all, what is Tetragon? It's eBPF-based security, observability, and runtime enforcement tool, which in plain English means that it's a tool that allows you to monitor a Linux kernel. And not only that, to some extent, it can even change the behavior of uh, executed uh, functions. I will, I will get to that uh, in the examples. Uh, it's written in Golang, and it can be both taught uh, as a tool that, can be, that you can run and get the results, or uh, it serves also as a library. Uh, Go is like very easily extensible. So what some people actually do is like use the Tetragon as a base and build on Tetragon its own tracing solution. That's actually what we do. Uh, what we do in Isovalent, we have like enterprise solution based on the, on the OSS uh, Tetragon. Despite being OSS project, Tetragon, Tetragon has pretty decent documentation. If you go to tetragon.io, uh, basically you will find lots of articles, lots of how-tos, uh, some videos. There's like a lot of documentation about how to use the Tetragon, like from the very beginning to uh, some really complicated examples. It's open source, it's hosted on the GitHub, so slash Helium slash Tetragon, you will find uh, all the sources uh, for the Tetragon project. And as for GitHub projects, it is like very nice uh, entry page where you can also get information how to, how to do things with the Tetragon. So, what the, what the tool, what the Tetragon is actually doing, first of all, it's eBPF based. I will get to, I have one slide uh, just for eBPF, like the next slide, so, uh, but to mention it, uh, it's very important. It's based on eBPF and uh, using the eBPF programs actually gives Tetragon the ability to monitor very, in a very performant way, uh, the Linux kernel. So, what can we actually uh, monitor? There's the usual suspects subsystems. Uh, first, uh, like by default, when you run the Tetragon, you will get the process execution trace. You don't need to configure anything. If you run Tetragon, you will get process execution trace, meaning that you will get uh, information, which we call event, for any process that gets executed and exited in the system. And the reason why we do that uh, by default is that it provides the context. And the context is, context is everything. Uh, later on, when, you, when I will show how actually to configure Tetragon to give you like other events, uh, you always need uh, the context to find out uh, where the event came from, right? So. Uh, you need to find out like uh, something happened, but who's behind it? What process? What PID, TID? So that's the process information. Uh, on top of the process information, Tetragon can also be run in Kubernetes environment. Actually, that's like uh, most of the use cases from our uh, customers to run Tetragon under Kubernetes uh, to monitor whatever is happening inside the pod. And in such an environment, in Kubernetes environment, we actually add also the Kubernetes context. So uh, you will actually find like all the pod containers, all that information part uh, of the process execution trace. So that's by default. That's what the Tetragon is doing uh, like all the time. Uh, then of course you can monitor all, all the subsystems that provides uh, the use cases uh, in, the, in the Linux system. So, of course, file access uh, monitoring, that has like a lot of use cases uh, that we need to cover because 
uh, almost everything needs file uh, in, in the Linux kernel or Linux system, like you need to write or read to the file to actually do something. So we can, we can monitor that. Uh, then security subsystem, that's a big pile of the use cases. Fortunately, there's uh, LSM hooks now available uh, from the kernel. So we can actually uh, monitor those as well. Um, Tetragon by itself actually uh, monitors the capabilities and namespaces uh, for the processes. And it can detect, it can be configured to detect changes in that. So whenever there's a change in the namespace, or some capability that you are interested in for a given process, we can get, we can get event uh, for that. And of course, big, big pile of use cases is coming uh, from the network uh, where Tetragon is used to uh, monitor the socket. It can show you what's happening uh, like on the uh, socket layer. That's for OSS, like in enterprise solution, we even go uh, and parse the actual protocols. The promise slide uh, on the eBPF. So as I said, Tetragon needs eBPF to actually work. Uh, I guess you are all familiar, so just to a few points to be. So we are on the, uh, on the same page. So eBPF is quite recent Linux kernel subsystems, subsystem uh, that allows to extend uh, the Linux kernel. What it means in practical sense is that you can actually extend uh, uh, the Linux kernel by writing uh, some program in the C. You compile that uh, into eBPF bytecode. You load the bytecode uh, to the kernel, and that code gets actually executed and provides, provides the data for you. So that's what we are actually doing in the Tetragon uh, as well. So, and of course, that's like one side of eBPF, like the tracing and monitoring. There's another side of the BPF. EBPF uh, in the networking part, but yeah, uh, for Tetracon, we care about the, uh, the tracing uh, capabilities. What's the benefit doing this with the EBPF is that it's really very performant. Uh, usually, uh, the, uh, the overhead, the performance overhead is uh, for our, when we did like the performance uh, benchmarks for our common use cases, of course, all depends on the configuration and uh, other things, but for common use cases, we always see like three to 5% of overhead uh, to workload uh, when the Tetragon is actually uh, running uh, together with the, uh, with the workload. Another big benefit is that it's very dynamic. So with the BPF program, you just need to have the support in the kernel and you are done. You load, unload your programs, you don't need to instrument the kernel, you don't need to reboot the kernel to get the functionality, just, uh, just like that. It's very dynamic. And last but not least, as far as I know, I must say, uh, it's the only subsystem that has its own documentary. It's called Unlocking the Kernel. You can find it on the YouTube. It's really cool. It's actually like uh, narrated by the people who, who created eBPF, and it's like how eBPF actually uh, was created, so I recommend Recommend to watch. So back to the Tetragon. Before we go to the examples, uh, I'd like to mention like what's the final result, like what to expect uh, out of the Tetragon. Uh, so as I said, you have some configuration. Uh, you load eBPF program based on the configuration, and the program will get executed eventually and produce uh, some sort of data. And those data we call actually events. So most of the use cases. Uh, you actually want to monitor those events. Those events can be stored on the disk, can be uh, offered for further processing through uh, uh, gRPC. Uh, all this is documented in our documentation, so it's like really easily uh, accessible. Uh, as I said, majority of the use cases, the end result is the event. We have also metrics, uh, Prometheus metrics uh, that we use. You can connect to Tetragon and get actually uh, even like the data, the result data in some form of matrix. Not for everything, but for something we do actually counts, and that's also very useful. So let's go to the examples. Let's run Tetragon. Hopefully you can see that. So I will not go through the 
through the details on how actually compile the Dragon and, and download. That's all covered in the documentation. So this is actually how we run the uh, Tetragon. Uh, the only thing you need to specify is uh, uh, it's the directory with all the eBPF programs that the Tetragon can load and by default uh, build, it will actually be in bpf slash object file. If you run it, uh, at this point actually Tetragon is doing the process execution trains, meaning every process that gets now created or exited, we have event for that, and that's then used for other events to actually get uh, to be attached. Uh, we can watch it. There's another binary called Tetra that does many things. Uh, one of the things is that it actually can connect to Tetragon and display all the events uh, in the real time. So if I actually run something, I will get the events uh, in, the, in the JSON. So if I actually pipe it to JQ, we can make some sense of it. So, can you see that? Can we see that? We can see. So this is the uh, one event. Uh, this is the process exec event of the execution trace. So this is basically if you're running uh, on the standard server environment, this is the execution context that you will get for any other events. So every process exec has like. Uh, data about the process that triggered the event. And also it has the pointer to the parent, which is like another process. So this way we can actually do like the process hierarchy. And of course you see all the, uh, all the things that you would expect, uh, all sorts of PID, UID, current working directory. We actually fetch even all the arguments. Uh, so you can, basically, uh, you can basically see what was executed and how it was executed. Uh, there's the other event, process exit, uh, that is triggered when the process actually uh, finished uh, and goes away. It can be also viewed by, in the compact mode, which is really nice if you want to find out uh, what's happening in your system. So now you can get like a compact view of like what was executed uh, or not. If I log in, log back, you can actually uh, find out uh, what were the comments that got executed like uh, when the SSH uh, session does this all profile uh, stuff that it's executing. So uh, it's like the default behavior, just doing the process execution trace. Uh, it can be like really useful for some folks uh, apparently uh, some of our customers like actually using the Tetragon just for the execution trace, especially in the Kubernetes environment, it gives you like the uh, good idea what's running and where. I promised the Kubernetes context, so that's the process exec that I was showing uh, in the standard server environment. But if you are on the Kubernetes, you will actually get all this pod information, so you will actually get all the information like uh, what was behind uh, that process uh, exec. If it's another event, of course, it's in the context of the other event. So what was the pod, what was the namespace, what was the container, all the things that uh, you want to know uh, when you're trying to pinpoint something uh, on the Kubernetes layer. So, uh, and of course the documentation has like, I said it's like a really good documentation you can find actually all the definitions for the events that we are uh, that we are using. So that's by default. You get the process execution trace. Uh, uh, but to really use the Tetragon, uh, you need to use uh, the tracing policy, which is what we called the configuration file. And that basically consists of these five uh, logical things. So as I said, Tetragon is tool uh, to monitor the Linux kernel. And in basically, uh, the OSS version actually monitors uh, the attach points that we are using is Linux kernel functions. And the data that we are mining are the arguments of those functions or the context arguments. So first of all, you need to know your use case. You need to know what you are actually doing. Might not be that easy all the time. That will actually give you the hooks 
that will actually, uh, by the use case, you need to define where you want to connect to kernel, which functions you want to connect to. Uh, then you need to specify for the tetragon, like, what data do you want to mine out of those functions? Uh, when you get the data, then you can actually do the filtering on the data. And the filtering is actually happen, happening in the kernel space. It's happening in the eBPF program, uh, which is actually why uh, that gives us like a lot of performance uh, gain because we don't need to send uh, all the data to the user space. And uh, because that's first like a lot of overhead to send all the things to user space and let's user space to do the filtering. So first the overhead, second also you can react on the filtering. You can actually, uh, when you actually filter something, you can decide uh, what to do. So that's, that's like the fourth logical point in the configuration of the Tetragon. You can define, okay, I filter something out. Should I send event? Should I kill some process? All this you can define uh, in, the, in the tracing policy. So let's see some tracing policy. Let's start with something simple. So tracing policy comes uh, as a YAML file. It has like the defined structure, of course, uh, starting with some monetary headers, uh, following like all those logical hooks, all the logical points that I was uh, just discussing. So first you need to, uh, first you need to know what you are doing. So this use case is actually monitoring every opening file in the system. And the logic behind it is we connect uh, to this function, have the install, which actually happening, kernel is calling this function every time it's actually installing uh, the file object to the file descriptor table, regardless what the file is being used for. But any opening of the file is actually happening uh, through this function. So that's our hooking point then you need to define the data. Uh, the data are the arguments of the function. First argument uh, if the, is the file descriptor number. Uh, second argument is actually the interesting one is the file object. And actually saying, telling Tetragon that it's a file. By this Tetragon actually knows it's kernel file object. And it has built in support to actually decode that object and get the information from the object. And the information is actually path of the file that's going to be open, and that's what we actually do like uh, when we filter. So that's, here is the filter part where you say, okay, let's match some arguments. Uh, the argument number, like index one, which means uh, argument two, and uh, we are saying that we are only interesting uh, in whoever is calling this function and is opening the slash tmp slash tetragon file. And the action here is post, which means just send event. Just so we can be notified if anybody's actually doing that. So let's run that. So to run actually tracing policy, you type tracing policy. Uh, you can see that, you can see that. Okay, so let's run it. Uh, okay, the G is missing. Tetragon is listening, is attached, so let's monitor the events. And yeah, let me echo to that file. And yeah, so there's the compact version. So you can actually see uh, there was event. The open is actually already translated by the Tetra tool because we use FD install a lot, so we actually have hooks in our applications to actually say, okay, it's open. And it's opening the slash TMP slash tetragon. Let's actually see how the real event looks like. So if I actually get the JSON event, to do that again. So here we go. So our hook was Kprobe. So what the tetragon is actually doing, it's loading the BPF program and attaching it uh, to the Kprobe, to the FD install function. So any event we are actually getting will be uh, Kprobe. It has the context, so we actually see which process is behind it. You can see the parent, and then the interesting part for the Kprobe is, okay, uh, this is the function. 
uh, you were monitoring. This is the argument, so if the number was free, and the file was actually pointing to slash TMP, slash tetragon. So that's something what we actually, uh, what we wanted. And the action, yeah, I'm not sure you can see it. The action here says, yeah, send, send the event, which actually, which actually happened. So that's like really easy, that's like really easy uh, tracing policy. We can make it a little bit more interesting and show how we actually do the enforcement, like one way of to do the enforcement. This is the very same tracing policy that I just executed with the one difference. It's saying the action instead of sending the event is doing the SQL. Uh, what this means is there's all the processing is the same. We hook to the same function. We get the arguments data, we filter them. At some point, we will actually filter the, uh, the file that we are actually interested in. And at that point, uh, we use one of the eBPF uh, helpers uh, and call the signal and kill the process that is actually executing, uh, that's actually opening uh, that file. Uh, there's like uh, some things uh, you need to be aware of. So the SQL is actually uh, coming from the uh, from the kernel, which is good. You don't need to rely like on the user space to actually send the SQL, so it never be in time, most likely. The other thing is that it might not be in time, even with uh, uh, coming uh, from the kernel, because uh, signals are delivered like when the uh, kernel processing is going back to user space, and if you are attaching the uh, some function that doesn't check on the signals, uh, the process will receive the SQL, but the function actually could get executed. We have some, I will, I will show you how to actually, we have some way to actually uh, help in this case, but let's see how we can actually kill first. So, so that's the, I'm loading the tracing policy displaying uh, the events and let's do let's do the cat so I tried to cat that file and it got killed if I actually run the echo it will get killed as well and the echo actually it wasn't the echo well it was the echo but it was echo implemented by the bash so ah can you see it <laughs> is there and uh, so the bash, you, so you actually kill the, you actually kill the process, you actually kill the bash that you were in, and it got you logged out out of the server, of course, because uh, once you finish the bash, you actually go away. So actually, it's good to show like uh, Tetragon will kill like whoever is trying to uh, touch the file. So in that case, it was actually, it was actually the bash. So. That's like uh, really easy, uh, really easy tracing policy. If you have like wider use case, most likely your policy uh, will be like really small, like the one that I just showed. If you want to take actually this use case and say, okay, reading of the file is fine, I want to kill whoever is writing to the file. That gets more interesting because it's more complicated. I will not go through the, all the details, however, it starts at the FD install. Uh, the most interesting part is at the end, uh, where we actually hook uh, to the syswrite, which is a syscall that does the, the writing uh, to the file. Again, we need to uh, describe like the arguments that we are interested in. In this case, based on the above configuration, we can actually get uh, the file path uh, from the file descriptor here, like the special FD actually tells Tetragon where to look for the file name that's being write, written to. And again, you can, where is this thing? Okay, you can filter like we do, and you can actually seek uh, the process. So if I run, if I run uh, this one, all the reads, will be possible, so if I do the get tetragon, I'm fine. If I do the, let's do the user bin echo now. It 
it gets killed. So with this, as I said, the more complicated your use case is, of course, the more complicated the tracing policy is. But it's a nice uh, way to actually show you uh, the other enforcement thing that we do. So first enf enforcement is actually sending the signal with the drawbacks I just described, uh, which means like you can't really like 100% uh, relay that the kill uh, will come like before the function gets actually executed. It might be true for some syscalls. It's definitely not true like if you are uh, hooking uh, some inside. Uh, kernel functions, not like uh, not just the syscall. But we have solution, at least uh, for the syscalls and a few other functions in the kernel, which is called override. This is like uh, the very same tracing policy for the syswrite, with just uh, one little detail that instead of killing that process they're trying to write, uh, we will actually say, skip that syscall completely and use uh, the return value minus 22, which is like Erno uh, invalid value, uh, as a return value for the user space process. So let's see. Let's see it in the practice. So I'm running uh, the tracing policy. Let's monitor the events. So again, I'm able to, I'm able to do the reading of the file. If I write something, the echo is actually not killed. Instead, uh, the write syscall returns like the invalid, invalid argument uh, or no. So this is, this is the enforcement part in the Tetragon name. We can do, we can kill uh, the process that's getting executed and or we can, in some cases, override uh, the execution of the function. The override is not available for all kernel functions. Uh, is there for the syscalls and few other few other mores, but for most of the use cases, uh, the syscall is actually is actually enough. I'm not sure how much time do I still have. Maybe three minutes. Okay. One last cool example. You might be actually aware of BCC a tool that is called. Oh, where am I? Okay. Uh, that is called TTY Snoop. Uh, and that actually you can like point this tool to the terminal and see like everything that was written to the terminal. We can do the same in the Tetragon. And yeah, I made this policy just to show how easy it is actually to mine the data out of the out of the kernel. So when you have like a terminal, a like a pseudo terminal uh, opened in the system, like any, anything that's going to be displayed in the terminal goes to the TT write function. Uh, so if you write the tracing policy to actually monitor that function and uh, read both of the arguments, one is uh, from one argument we mine like uh, the path of the terminal, the other argument holds uh, the data that are going to be written to a terminal. We can actually have the trace of everything that goes to the terminal on the server. And with all the process context information and the time, you can actually be able to, to actually see what was happening like, you see, like administrator see some, something weird happening like at some logs, you can actually go and open and replay whatever was happening on the terminal. So, it's already running, so let's actually, yeah. Uh, get events has like nice, uh, nice extension. If you say dash t, it will actually do the terminal monitoring. So, if I write the uh, the terminal path, it will actually start uh, like the terminal that I have like uh, the bottom one. So, whatever I write in the bottom one. Uh, the Tetra is monitoring the Tetragon and reading the events and replaying on this terminal whatever happens on this terminal. I hope it's <laughs> understandable. So anything that happens, we will actually, we will actually see. You will not see the passwords. You have that in the enterprise solution. And 
yeah, also like the terminal thing, because everything that goes through the terminal is actually uh, uh, it's going through the write, even even like the graphic stuff. So we can actually uh, replay to very detail what's happening on the terminal. And yeah, I think I need to end. So if you have any questions, you have questions. So the question is about the overhead. So I actually mentioned that we actually, uh, when we are releasing like Tetragon 1.0, we did a bunch of uh, the benchmarks. And so we did this like, uh, did the every use case that we are doing, like the most common use cases that people actually want us, want the Tetragon to be running. And most of them has like, the overhead was like four, uh, three to 5%. It of course depends like, on how many events you want to send to the user space, that, that adds a lot. Uh, so meaning like how specific your filter is, but you are aiming like to one specific event and like sending the event to the user space is not the big eater. Uh, then actually just running and filtering gives you like this three to 5% in our average use case. How does it relate to something like system traps? What do you mean? Uh, so system traps can do a lot of things so yeah, the question is how is this different from system tab? I would say a lot. <laughs> uh, so the way I know system tab, uh, do I know system tab? Yeah. Uh, it's using like kernel modules, right? Now nowadays maybe even eBPF programs. Uh, I'm not sure how much configurable system tab is actually. Like you really need to have specific use case which you, uh, there's like configuration language to system tab, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. basically like a scripted language that you mm. can hook into a function and do whatever you do before you call the function, mm. and then again do whatever you want as the function as it's doing. So for example, when you said the override, mm -hmm. so I just immediately went to system tab because that's something I can do. I can just you can say, do it. Check whatever that Yeah, I don't know much about system tab. I heard they are using eBPF now. However, I doubt they can run under Kubernetes. But probably not. I don't know. Fair question. <laughs> Like you are interested? I mean, I mean about, uh, uh, about security. Errors uh, based on policy and the policy is based on uh, SDIM. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm actually sure what that is. <laughs> if, no. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's something I forgot to mention. Yeah, it's actually to create the tracing policy required some Linux kernel knowledge. And definitely, like, it's not for everyone. So we actually do have, like, the library of the tracing policy that we normally use. It's, it's like here, uh, examples tracing policy in the, in the sources. And it's definitely... If it doesn't fit your use case, it's definitely like the best place to start. You will actually, if it, if it doesn't have your use case, it will be close enough or uh, you will find something uh, that you can change to fit your needs. So, yeah. no problem. Yeah, so the question is like, 
how are we uh, dealing with different kernel versions? The answer is uh, uh, it's a challenge, but uh, we can actually run be running Tetragon uh, on the 4.19 uh, with these uh, policies. Some policies you need to, there are some of the policies are actually marked like, uh, like the TTY is like this is the generic one, and this is for kernel 5.4, which had some quirk, which needs to be like reflected, of course, in the policy. Uh, but like a lot of the functions that we hook to in the kernel that we need for the use cases are actually quite stable. Like the FD install that I, that I showed in an example is there forever, and hopefully it will stay there. <laughs> um, but the syscalls, for example, they will not change, right? So this, these, are, these are pretty stable. Uh, what changes like uh, mining of the arguments, the arguments can change, of course, but we can handle that. We have like special programs for different kernel versions, uh, the one that needs to be like special, and that's what, that's what loaded. And we actually, we have like GitHub CI, and the CI is running like all sorts of tests, starting from kernel 419 to currently actually BPF next kernel, uh, like the cutting edge of the upstream. And I was told I'm out of time, so thank you.